is uh, if you have any questions, shout them out, holler at you know, I've got nothing else to do. I could be be here as long as you need me to. Uh, to tell you what we have going on in the shoulders. You know, I'm from Florence, but collectively they call that area in northwest Alabama the shoulders. Uh, Logan, how are you to proceed on this? Just We're good. You just let me know when you're in. Go ahead, hit the hit the slide. The shoulders where I'm at. There we go. I'm in the northwest corner of the state, 120 miles from here. From my house to here today, 120 miles. Uh, click on through here. Well, the Tennessee River is, is my home waters. Pretty neat thing. Uh, 652 <coughs> miles from Knoxville to Paducah, Kentucky. We've got two dams in the Shoals area that I'll spend most of my time talking to you about tonight. That really colors most of what I do. The two big dams there. Uh, it gives us three impoundments. we got Wheeler Lake upstream, impounded by Wheeler Dam. And in between, I've got my pointer here, in between Wheeler and Wilson Dam, the short little Wilson Lake was the former home of the world record smallmouth. And downstream, the lake that's getting most of the noise now on Bassmaster tournaments and whatnot is Pickwick Lake. So we've got, from headquarters in the shoals, we've got Wheeler, Wilson, and Pickwick that I fish on the lakes proper. Most of what I do is in the tail races below those two dams and in the tributaries of those. So the big news about coming to Florence, uh, and I'll get I'll address more of this later. There are tributaries that come in from the south and, and even from the west, but the big news is the ones coming in from the north. That's where the smallmouth are. Just uh, give you a little geography lesson in all this today. But uh, the, it's really weird that the river flows this way. You've never thought about this little smiley face. Uh, the Cumberland Plateau up here makes the makes the water happen. We've got limestone stream beds flowing from the north and not from the south. So if you're over in this area and fishing with me, and we start a day in the tail race or on the lake and want to run up a creek to catch smallmouth, we'll definitely go north. The streams on the south side do have smallmouth at the mouth, but if you go up their tributaries, smallmouth don't spawn on the south side tributaries. Uh, I did get an old geology degree when I was in college. The, the rocks in the Cumberland Plateau were like Paleozoic, old, old, old. And all the area on the south side of the river is, is uh, Cenozoic. You can go south of the river and find shark's teeth and starfish. You know, there ain't none of that north of the river. Pretty, pretty neat. But anyway, from a fishing standpoint, what we have in these northern tributaries the characteristics of these creeks mirrors the, the river. You've got the, the three things that make smallmouth happy. You've got broken, broken water and flow. You have limestone bottom and thumbnail sized pea gravel. And you've got to have at least two of those three things to make smallmouth spawn. And none of the streams coming in from the south have that. They're all slow flow, no limestone, no pea gravel. So anyway. The, the good news if you come and plan a trip to the Shoals area, unlike a lot of fishing trips, you, there's plenty of plan B here. If you come over to do a tail race trip and the, the flow is not cooperating, you've got action on the lakes and multiple tributaries. So do things a lot of different ways over here. What's the next one? Uh, yeah. yeah, it's called the Shoals, the Shoals area because of the, just the nature of the river. The Tennessee River drops 513 feet over that 652 miles. Pretty good drop over the first 200 miles, but the last 140 feet in 30 miles. Uh, the old history books, it was dammed up in 1915, called it the Niagara of the South. Pretty significant drop in elevation. And after the shoals, it really peters out and goes really slow. It's a, an odd situation. It's not that the the mountains here are so high to force the water north, but the hollers are deep. So we've, we've got good elevation below, good current. What's my next one, Logan? Yeah. Ah, I'm sorry. I, don't, I said there wouldn't be a test. Go ahead and skip to the next one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's pretty cool. The history of the river, uh, I was reading about this uh, over the pandemic. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt's book, How the West Was Won, called the, uh, the trip down the river in 1779, one of the great moments in uh, Manifest Destiny. John Donaldson uh, floated that in 1779 when the Revolutionary War was still going on and uh, over the shoals and 
the area that's now dammed up. So anyway, the first decision to make when you're fishing in the shoals depends on what's happening in the tail races. Uh, Wheeler Dam tail race, Big Dam, and the Wilson Dam tail race. The elevation, 507 and 414 play in. If the elevation's high, but the flow is low, that's gonna affect how you're fishing. Uh, I'm not sure, I've never fished, so I haven't fished here on the coast in a long time. I'm not sure what your normal CFS flow is. But these two dams put out a lot of, a lot of flow. Uh, on the Tennessee River proper, there are nine dams on the main lake and 30 dams on the tributaries. These two dams make more electricity than all the others combined. Now we've had flow in the 300,000 CFS range, you know, for months at a time last spring. So when you're fishing over here, the main thing that you're going to consider is how much flow. Uh, today they were flowing 50,000 CFS, pretty hot for me. Magic number for me, if I'm fishing below the dam, is going to put the fly rod is about 30,000 CFS. Like when Mike, when Mike came and fished with me, it was about 15,000, you know, just a little trickle. Uh, that makes most of the Bassmaster gear guys mad. It makes me happy with the fly rod, you know, because you can get down to the bottom if you need to. But 30,000 feet, that's your, your operating. 30,000 and less is optimal for fishing below these dams. So that's my first check. How much flow is that? TVA is really good, better than some of the Corps of Engineer control dams. You get at least a 48 hour window on knowing how much flows to expect over the next 48 hours. The exception to always checking the dams first is if it's mid-June. In mid-June, we have some tremendous mayfly hatches. I know the, the Huntsville Fly Fishing Club and the Tupelo Fly Fishing Club always descend on our lakes in June. If I wake up in June and my house, this is my actual front door of my house. <laughs> if the front door of my house looks like this around Father's Day, I don't go below the dam that day. You know, so we have some really significant X hatches in mid-June. Usually you can count on the, uh, yeah, going, going to the, it's on your front door. Going, going to the dam and it looks like this at the gas station, you, you change gears and get a popper and go to the lake. Um, yeah, we have some really heavy hatches. But that's usually from Father's Day to the British Open weekend. That's how I, how I gauge when our hatches happen. Uh, some years we have great ones, some years we don't. Uh, Wilson is pretty special for its Mayfly hatch at Wilson Lake in that it's a really short lake. The lake that's between Wheeler Dam and Wilson Dam, it's only 15 miles long. Really short lake, but it's an uh, average 30 feet deep. So when the mayflies hatch early in June, you've still got smallmouth in the in the in the range of those flies. Hatches that happen later in the summer, usually the smallmouth are already deep. Or the hatches that happen in late July. So the mayfly time, if you're planning on coming over the shoals, mid June is the best. Uh, a couple of things on the tail races, the two tail races we have below Wheeler Dam and Wilson Dam, got a lot of things in common. Uh, in that the boat ramps are all on the south side of the river. The navigation locks are all on the north side of the river. The turbines are on the south side of the river. Uh, we have TVA controlled ramps, so they've got restroom facilities. They're monitored. When I'm fishing the tail races, I use a six weight as a minimum. Always keep an eight weight rigged up in the boat somewhere. And um, arsenal of sinking lines. Sinking lines is a big part of what we do. Uh, and I, I can talk sinking lines with you all day. Uh, if they make a new sinking line tomorrow, I'll probably buy it. I've got shooting heads. I've got clear mono lines. I've tried every system in the world to get down deep and, and regulate where you put a fly in the strike zone. But it's always a part of the deal over there. Uh, let's see the next slide. I was going to do this to you guys. The first dam upstream, closest one to you, is Wheeler Dam. This is an aerial shot of it. If you're coming in from 278, just 30 miles. 30 miles west of I-65 is Wheeler Dam. Big long dam built in 1933. It's 1.2 miles across, 74 feet high. The access to this suck, oh, back up one more time. Access is just, again, just on the south side, there's a public boat ramp here. On all the TVA dams, the, the boat ramps are on the south side and you have access with another ramp to the north side to get to Wheeler Lake. So you got options if you're coming to fish and hauling your own boat. 
But this area are the turbines. On Wheeler Dam, there are 11 power production units, 11 turbines. And each one of those can produce up to 15,000 CFS. On TVA, if you, back in the day before the internet, when you used to have to call TVA on the phone, and they would tell you, give you their generators and tell you zero generators or one generator or two or more. And for most of the TVA dams, that's good. That's all you need to know because most dams only have two generators. This one's got 11. So if they tell you two or more generators, it could be 20,000 CFS or it could be 150,000 CFS. So it's great now that you can look on their website, uh, it's lakeinfo.tva.gov and see exactly what's going on hour by hour. But these are the units. Uh, I wish this were a little brighter. So let's see what we got next. Next slide. Yeah, here we go. On this dam, you can actually see the white little battery shapes there or that are the power units. There's a long stretch here that we don't have on our other dam. This is one of the big differences between the power units and the lock. There's a, a good mile of dead water that's pretty shallow and not much fishing happens here. The high part over here is a 70 foot lock, power lock to go from Wheeler to Wilson Lake. Most of the fishing that happens on the Wheeler Dam tail race happens in this quadrant. Most people fish either above the towers or below the towers, depending on how much flow is happening. Um, and these towers are really the only obstruction out there, the towers in the island. Uh, most people will like myself, we'll set up outside whatever unit's on. In this picture, you can tell it looks like number nine is operating, and I'll sit up outside that sucker just like you're standing on a creek bank, you know, and drift into the current. In the fall, when all the turbines are typically operating and there's much more flow, guys will cycle up and drift, start at the head of the operation and drift down below the towers. Uh, Oh, the rodeo. You've got usually eight seconds to go from here to the towers. You can make one more cast and, and crank up and do it again over and over. And uh, when it's like that, how deep are you? That's that. Good question. Thank you. This is the head of the old Muscle Shoals. Again, remember the uh, the first map where I said the river dropped so many feet, 140 feet and 30 miles? This was the head of the shoals, the start of the rapids. So it's actually on a big shelf. The first the first, I guess, three quarters of a mile below the dam is pretty consistent, eight to 10 feet deep. Eight to 10 feet deep. Uh, that gives you, if you picture this cube of water coming down at 30,000 CFS, 200 yards across and 10 feet deep, it's, it's a big challenge. Yeah, that's why everything above 30,000, 40,000 CFS gets weird. Uh, I will get up in the, in the kitchen here at low flows. You know, around 30,000, but when it's flowing 50 or 60,000, I'll stay behind. You know, it gets a little deeper. Once you cross the three quarter mile mark, the water drops. You hit those rapids that are submerged now, and you got a 30 foot depth average in this lake. And it's a short little stubby lake, only 15 miles long. So you're doing a, like a drift. Doing, doing a drift. You're doing a, a drift. Are you using a cork or? No. No, just, just, a, just a, whatever it takes, depends on the flow. Uh, one of the big challenges here is uh, some of the guys I get who fish with me is a guy that like to cast 90 feet short, short cast or what it takes here. If you get 90 feet of fly line out in that much water, you've got so many snakes, it's almost impossible to get a strike. You know, you really, I have better hookup ratios with a uh, consistent diameter full sink line, you know, but you lose a lot of clousers that way. It's just part of the game. And I, again, for equipment and gear, I use a lot of six to eight weight rods and disposable flies. You know, I love a game changer as much as anybody else, but it's tough to lose one of those suckers on the bottom every other drift. So, are you using the fluorocarbon leader or not straight from the I, I use fluorocarbon most of the time, yes, for fluorocarbon. That helps you sink. Though. Yeah, it helps you get down. Anything to help you get down. Uh, I do, I like a lot of shooting heads. You know, they're just harder to come by here. Uh, you know, uh, consistent diameter, 60 foot running line, like a steelhead operation, and then change the head to your fly line. Uh, talking earlier about that, I keep some custom ones done, old 
sinking full sinking lines that I've chopped up into 10, 15, 20 foot sections and looped myself to help get down to the right depth. And it's not always sinking line. You know, don't, don't get me wrong. There are times when the fish are in the top of the water column and we're throwing deceivers that are in the top two feet of the water column. But you've got to be prepared to always get a little deeper. Uh, but this dam, this dam is easier to fish as someone who's never been there before. It's the biggest danger here is getting a false sense of security because there's so much depth. If you sneak over in this shallow area, you'll actually see the bowlers <coughs> sitting out of the water. And there's also no current in this area. Most folks stay out of here. But the water in the flow itself is so deep that there's the biggest danger is, you know, some hillbilly plowing into you while he's trolling a rooster tail across there. You have to keep your head on the swivel. Uh, the towers are not, you know, they're, they're not a big construction, but fishing this dam is completely different than the other. Uh, this Tail race is the head of the 15, 15 uh, mile long Wilson Lake. And there are a couple of good options here. If I, after I fish the tail race in the morning, you've got two tributaries that feed Wilson Lake from the north side, Blue Water Creek, where I live, and Shoal Creek, where Davy Crockett lived. You can go upstream to Davy Crockett Park and they actually stock trout there. Pretty cool, pretty cool little creek. So, whew. This one's easier to do if you're doing it yourself. <clears throat> it's a easy boat launch. You can get into bass without having to crank the big motor. And get up close to the back. All right, the next slide I've got, yeah. Tail races are pretty, pretty hot. <laughs> if I can get in an eddy close to the dam, this, that's the kind of wave action you're looking at. Yeah. yeah it's, <laughs> I've got some great video of it that I don't show my wife or she wouldn't let me go. <laughs> but it, it's pretty bouncy up there when all those units are running. Uh, one of the neat features, yeah, the, on the far left on both of our dams, the, the three units to the farthest left are newer units, and they make a great big fuss. The units to the right could be running the same CFS that would never make a bubble. But these new units really kick up the water, and they are fun to fish. So you can tell, obviously, the, the slack water just to the left of those units. It's just like standing on a creek bank. You've got to figure out which units are running. Uh, I wish we could see this. There are signs all over the dam that say automatic turbines, keep out. Uh, and most folks that fish up there don't really have an idea what that means. The, the dams are not controlled there anymore on site. The guy who's deciding which turbines to run is actually in Knoxville looking at a temperature screen. And they can decide on a minute's notice to cut off number 11 and switch on number nine. You know, and if you're up there fishing right in front of number nine, that's, that's an interesting day. Because uh, when they kick on, they make a hole in the water. But the turbines kind of make up. You see boats get lower. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting up there. But those, those are pretty fun. Uh, I wouldn't anchor up there. Uh, my dad would probably come out of the grave and whoop me if he knew I was cutting the big motor off up there. But uh, that's uh, pretty easy to do on your own. I was going to say something else and I forgot. What's the next slide? All right, here's the aerial view of that. Wheeler Dam here and your launch. You've got public boat access here at Shell Creek, which is looks like a long way away, but that's just 12 miles and below Wilson Dam. You can tell from the lack of circles on this sucker that there aren't many midstream things to fish. Okay. It's a short, deep lake. There are a couple of submerged islands here at the mouth of Town Creek and edge of the channel, but these guys are, you know, 10 feet deep. This island, I like to fish in the heat of summer. It's uh, almost like two, three feet underwater. Uh, and Big strikers like to gang up and use it as a backstop and crash shed. That's a pretty good spot to fish. But by and large, there are very few contour lines moving out into the lake. Uh, but where they are, this spot in particular, is where the mayflies hatch. It's where the heavy hatches are going to be. And you can tell, I've got a couple of slides coming. You can tell those areas by where the long piers are. Hit the next one there a little bit. Okay. Yeah, here's our ramp. The ramp, the ramp. There's my house. If you drive up Blue Water Creek across from 
the boat ramp up this tributary. The last place that has a boat ramp is my house. If you need to come visit, ever arrived by boat. Yeah, I was launching my house to get to Wheeler Bend. It's quicker than driving a car. Are you in the car that can turn? Yeah. Like it there. What's the next one, Logan? Let's see. Here we go. The other access points. These are the spots where the hatch is had. What's the next one? Sorry. The sailing line, the inundated islands. Mostly it's clear sailing. This is, if y'all ever fished Smith Lake, sort of similar to the coves in Smith where it's really straight down. Uh, hit the next one. Sorry, do it again. I got too many of these. But this is one of the few long piers that you'll see on Wilson Lake. This is on that north shore close to me where the contour lines were. And those are dead willow flies, the willow fly husks. Most piers on Wilson Lake don't look like this. Most of them are right tucked on the bluff like this. This is a much more typical Wilson Lake shoreline. I always, you know, my joke is I like, I, when I want to feel better about the economy, I take a boat ride around Wilson Lake because this is what it looks like. And we fish this. It's uh, the typical way that after I fish the tail race and hit these bluffs, I'm actually going to pound those bluffs that are 10, 15, 30 feet deep straight down right off the bluff because they are jagged limestone and they're smallmouth in these cuts. And even in the coves going back in, in every cove, there are springs feeding in. So it's, a, it's full of smallmouth. Going into the coves and you see the trees that are laying straight down instead of laying out into the lake. You know, there's some depth in those coves. And I'll uh, see the next one, yeah. Sneaking into a cove. Those are what you come for. Fish pole. Throwing clouders in the coves. I don't do a lot of crawfish stuff. You know, the tip, if you read the, you know, how to fish, fly fish for smallmouth and read Harry Murray, and all that stuff. If I'm on the creeks, on the tributaries, crawdads are my go-to. But on these lakes, it's uh, shad based. You know, it's it's game changers and deceivers and clousers. Yes, sir. All all smaller or some large mouth. There's some large mouth. Uh, Pickwick in particular, like the further downstream, has gotten a good reputation lately because of the introduction of hydrilla. It looks like Gunnersville on the lower end of the lake. This big freaking huge beds of grass and uh, it's made the, the large mouth really jump up. They've had a lot of good bags in the last couple of years of those tournaments. The small mouth are what makes it happen. Uh, like on my creek in particular where I live on Blue Water, the smallest of the tributaries, if you catch a bass, it's a small mouth. <coughs> All right, let's see what I got next. Yeah, the next day I'm going downstream is Wilson. It's the big day. Uh, this is a, my, one of my favorite scenes, going up to Wilson Lake. Wilson Lake is, again, 15 miles downstream. Kind of structured the same, it looks like, from the, from the get-go. You know, pretty long dam, turbines on the south side, locks on the north, but much more stuff going on here. Uh, Wheeler Dam, uh, 6,200 feet long. Wilson's only 4,000 feet long. And most of it is covered up with these islands that you can't see very well here. Uh, the lock goes into a separate channel that's separated from the power by Patton Island and a smaller island here called Jackson Island. And this area is probably the most famous in the Shoals area called the Horseshoe between those two islands where most of the smallmouth spawning happens. Uh, I hope I live to see a day when we have catch and release until June there, but I've got some, uh, oh. I've seen a hundred boats in this horseshoe when smallmouth was spawning before. And when we still have them, they reload. You know, I've argued with guys online about it. Uh, I know the Susquehanna just about got overfished, you know, in our lifetime. Uh, and I hope that never happens here because it's, it's a tough road back once you overfish a, a species. But this horseshoe, my goodness, is a great fishery. Wheeler Dam upstream has 11 turbines. <clears throat> it would be the biggest on the river system by far, except for this dam. It's got 21 turbines. Again, those two dams make more electricity than all the others combined. It's 137 feet tall. It's the big day. Uh, you can't see these turbines here. They're behind that cool Greco-Roman facade. 
My grandfather moved to Florence to help build that dam in 1915. Pretty neat. Uh, it was built to provide nitrates for bombs in World War I. The Germans were blockading South America, so they built this dam for the nitrates. Uh, as soon as it was finished, the war was over, and it sank. Henry Ford, if you ever come visit Florence, you'll see pictures all over town of when Henry Ford tried to come buy the dam. Offered $6 million to the federal government in 1921 to buy the whole thing. Brought Thomas Edison with him and proposed a whole city. This before he ever built a car in Detroit. Was going to put his whole production in a city that still stands. You can still see the grid work on the south side of the river called Ford City. All they got left there is a post office now. I know. Kindergarten. It didn't happen. George Norris, the senator from Nebraska, was just, I guess he just hated Ford, but he stonewalled his ass. <laughs> he stonewalled three different presidents. And when FDR was elected in 33, the first act of the New Deal was the creation of TBA. This dam predates TBA by 18 years. And that's really important. Uh, important for me living on Wilson Lake. The fact that this dam was built before TVA ever came into existence it means that the water that was impounded back here on Wilson Lake doesn't fluctuate. I didn't understand that when I was growing up. I lived on Pickwick growing up and the water goes from 414 feet in the summer to 404, you know, the water goes away in the winter. The water doesn't do that on Wilson Lake. We call it the money lake. But it's because the Corps of Engineers has the proprietary whatever, on the, on the water levels. Wilson Lake upstream is at 507 above sea level in the summer. In the wintertime, it goes down to 505, only drops two feet. All the other lakes in the Tennessee River, if you've ever driven up to, to Waynesville or to the Little Tennessee, you'll notice all those piers on the sides of the hollers where they drop the winter water. They drop them all except Wilson because it predates TVA. But those units are amazing. Uh, the other interesting thing about this dam is how close the lock is. That lock goes 100 plus feet, 108 feet from Wilson to Pickwick Lake. It's still the single largest drop in a lock east of the Mississippi. Pretty cool stuff. It was second only to the Panama Canal for about 30 years, but a big old lock. The other big difference that this makes in your fishing is when they dump that lock and pull the plug, the water comes right up your dress. So if you're fishing in front of the horseshoe, they call this area the hole. If you're fishing in the hole, when, when the horn goes off, they, you can either get behind the wing wall or uh, hope that it all works out. <laughs> uh, the, the number of units here is really incredible. Uh, the water elevation on this particular stretch of water, since it's so narrow compared to Wheeler Dam, when they cut a unit on, on the south shore from here, the elevation will actually change side to side in the lake. From side to side, it's, 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 I don't know if I'll ever figure it out, but I'll, I'll try. This is called the Rock Pile Recreation Area on the TBA maps. And you can see here barely with this crappy picture, but it is, by comparison, probably an average of six feet deep below this dam, and it is filled with five foot tall boulders. I tell everybody it's a great place to either get a guide or to take your brother-in-law's boat. <laughs> it's like going to the Ocoee and seeing the, the, the kayak skid marks on rock. There's a lot of glitter on the top of those rocks. Uh, and you can never learn it. It changes in every flood. So let the next slide, let's see what I got. So from the end of Wilson Lake, you've got boat ramps actually here and here. We could access both. Really like it. I'll do that some days. I'll fish below Wilson Dam in the morning, motor all the way over to here and launch and be on Wilson Lake. Florence proper, where the University of North Alabama is, has a great harbor, boat launch, campgrounds here as well, plenty of hotels. This lake, by comparison to the Wilson, is 49 miles long. I grew up downstream in a little town called Waterloo, Alabama. Waterloo, Alabama. I was the biggest graduating class ever. 
40 kids. Uh, and it's uh, on the lake directly across from Iuka, Mississippi. The border of Alabama, Mississippi, and Tennessee is actually in the water downstream on Pickwick Lake. So you do have some reciprocity issues with licensing if you get down that far. Most of my fishing, if I were to come from out of town, would be concentrated in the area in the tail race. And, and you can tell from the picture here, this acts much more like a river. Yeah. Where we're at back home, we either fish up on the lake or down on the river. Because Pickwick definitely acts like a river compared to Wilson. Uh, just so much more near the flow, so much more concentrated. So, all right, what's the next slide? Where have I got? There's the, the same thing. Another boat ramp here. What's the next, Logan? Yeah, tall. That's a big one. better picture of the rocks. You can actually see the old mix and shoot. In my younger days, we used to take a John boat over there and get it out and wait. I wouldn't do that now for a million dollars. But uh, again, big, big smallmouth. We also have a healthy striper fishery there. Oh, yeah, that's a great shot of fishing in the flow. Little boats behind the ring walls. And just tons, tons of rocks. Tons of rocks, tons of currents. Big drum, Gasper Goop everywhere. <laughs> we had a great year for the stripers this past spring. I don't know about y'all. We, we, I caught more uh, fisheries biologists, but he tells me they were a year old, like 14 inch saltwater stripers. I had some trips this spring where that's all we caught all day long. So I'm hoping in a couple of years we can get some more of these guys. So, all right. Yeah, the wing walls are your safety areas. The new units here are actually separated by a wing wall, and that's to prevent erosion and stuff at the base of the dam. Uh, again, that sucker was built in 1915, and folks still drive across it. Right. It's the side of the uh, Jackson Island. All right. What else we got? My typical boat below the dams. I use my little John boat because I also double going up the creeks. The best trip that I do for folks is spending the morning below the dam of the tail race and then heading up one of the tributaries. And that's my little four wheel drive boat. You can get about four inches deep, bang off the rocks. Uh, but you can head all the way up to Blue Water or Shoal Creek or Cypress Creek if you've got a shallow draft boat and get out and wait. And that's that's my best trip. And if I were coming up there, that's what I'd want to do. Was I like it? And that's the rest of the fleet. The big center console boat may be moving to Florida. Again, I'm about to retire. Yeah. Debating whether I'm going to be full time there or at least a, one residence down on the Gulf Coast. Uh, that boat spent this past summer, you know, in Carabell. But anyway, that's what I got. If you're interested in coming up and just doing a weight trip or a float trip, again, the three big tributaries. Uh, I could just talk about this. <laughs> the three bears, the one I live on is like the mama bear. It's a little too, a little too small for most people, a little too clear, a little too shallow. But it's a, definitely a sight casting gig where you don't need to just blindly cast anywhere you walk. You need to pick out a hole and picture a hole, but they're a good fish anywhere in it. Shoal Creek is the big day, the papa bear. <clears throat> a float trip on Shoal Creek actually starts in Tennessee. We go from Iron City, Tennessee, just across the state line and end up almost in Florence. And it's an eight hour float. It's a pretty big commitment, but it's very, very remote. When you pass a couple of houses in an eight hour float. Uh, and the good news and the bad news about the baby bear is just right at Cypress Creek. It probably gets most of the attention and press from Florence. It's a, it's a perfect size creek. Uh, I screwed up a few years ago when I was running the fly shop and built a boat ramp there at the public park. So now I've got every kayak in America there. <laughs> but it's a, there's a five mile float literally through downtown Florence. Great little stream, great takeout at a public park, good public parking on both ends. It's just right. But it empties into Pickwick Lake. So you can run from Wilson Dam and be up Cypress Creek into weightable water you know, in a 20 minute boat ride with a 50 horse motor. So, see what else I got? Yeah, that's blue water. It's not a very good picture, I'm sorry. But it does hold some good fish. A couple of the best smallmouth I got this summer were on my little bit of blue water ankle deep creek. Good smallmouth. 
That uh, little town on the Shoal Creek, Iron, Iron, Iron City. Iron City. Are you launching just below the city? You're, you're going to kayak over there? Yes. Yeah, there's actually a, a, a livery there, too. Just below that bridge? Just below the bridge. On, I think it's 242. Yeah. Tennessee 242. So, yeah, they, they shuttle you also. They were doing a $15 shuttle this summer. So, yeah, that's a blue water fish. Uh, when you float from Iron City down, that's the takeout point. It's a big, big bridge in, uh, on County Road 8, Goose Shoals. Uh, I've taken groups of 15 there waiting, and you can spread out and not be able to hear each other. It's a, it's a big, wide, wet road of creek. It's the last stretch of broken water before Shoal Creek hits Wilson Lake. Hit the next slide, that's what I got. Yeah, great looking water. Broken water, gravel, ripples, limestone bottom. I can get my boat up to that within sight of the bridge. That's what I got. And all the way up, we got a good smallmouth. This is actually, I took this picture standing on the bridge looking downstream. I can run my boat all the way to there and then hop out and spend the rest of the day waiting. There we are. That's actually from trips this summer, running upstream right below that bridge. Cypress Creek downtown has a little different grass action. Looks a little bit like the Little Red. We've been to Little Red in Arkansas and Heber Springs. It's got that same, I'm a geology guy. Don't know, my, don't know my biology, but whatever grass that is. But it's also got the same chunky limestone and good smallmouth. And that's what you come for. Some toes. So there we go. I'm sorry if I kept you away from your pie. <laughs> but uh, any, anybody have anything they'd like to ask me while I'm Yeah, uh, more information about your trips. Uh, what do you charge? I charge. I do basically. I, I again, I don't do this to make a living. You know, I'm a school teacher, and, and it's just I don't even need, need any more toys. Uh, but I do a hundred and fifty dollar trip. That's my tail race trip for a single person. I would rather take a single person. Uh, you know, most of most of my guide trips on the creeks, especially, are me looking for fish, like a son of a gun, being an extra set of eyes watching your back cast and watching the water. I really, I'll take two people, but I feel like I'm doing everybody a disservice when I do. It's so much harder. Uh, I feel like I, I shortchange somebody when I take two folks. But anyway, I do a $150, four hour, five hour trip. If you want to combo it and do something different. A lot of my folks who come in from out of town will do a morning trip, a daylight till 10 a.m. And I'll get them back to their hotel and do another half day in the evening. Uh, pretty easy stuff. We got a lot of options, uh, and I'll be honest with you. If you call and want to want to fish, I'll tell you what's happening and what's not. Uh, that's what I got. I've got all gear. I guess six weights, or if you had to bring one rod, six weights are it. Um, again, I flies. I, I hate to tell this to fly clubs. Usually, when I go to a fly club, they're doing a fly time now, and I have to tell everybody I'm kind of a presentationist. I really think it matters about whatever you whatever you have put in front of a fish. Yeah. More than what fly you're using, and that usually gets a lot of booze from the fly tires. You want to make everything perfect. Make sure you think. Yes. How does the fishery change during the year? You, know, you said the, the mayflies are hot in June. Mayflies are hot in June. One of the I usually take off through the winter. Uh, after Thanksgiving, I don't fish much through the winter. I'll start back in March or maybe late February, depending on the water temperature, once we get to 45 degrees, and that may be late February, or it might be late March. Sure. You, you know, it's North Alabama. It's like it might, here. It might snow. Anymore. It might snow. It might snow. <laughs> so but usually, what I, and I, I've quit fishing for spawning fish. I will fish for the spawning white bass. We've got a great white bass run, so I do a lot of lessons and taking folks, kids out, and, and people who want to learn to fly fish. So. March is hard to beat for running into a pre-spawn smallmouth and also running into white bass. Believe that's sinking line. I really won't have any floating line on my rods until April, late April. Is there like a particular moment that would be optimal for catching both a smallmouth and a striper bass? June. June. Yeah, those stripers I caught this year. I was gone this past summer. I stayed in Clearwater, Florida, tarpon fishing. <laughs> for a nice. month of, for a month of red tide. I got there right when the red tide hit. <laughs> Actually, we got there the day the hurricane hit, and then the red tide was after that. So <laughs> time that just right. Yeah, time that just right. That was a beauty. 
But, so, but the, all my strikers I caught this year were the, the big strikers, the 20 pounders <laughs> were in the first of June. Yes, sir. If somebody were foolish enough to insist on coming up in the winter, is he is supposed to fish behind the tail races? Yeah, the tail races. The, that's where I would be. And it depends on the flow, uh, the flow and the elevation. You know, I wouldn't go below Wilson Dam right now if, if Beyonce was paying me to get out there and take her on boat ride. It's just the water's too low. Uh, the water level, it may only be 50,000 CFS, but if the water is 404 feet above sea level instead of 415, it's like, oh, like being in a Walmart parking lot on Black Friday. It's crazy. Yeah, you're going to wreck the boat. So I would fish below Wheeler Dam in the winter. I, I would do that cold weather. So I do a lot of stuff below both. I live closer to Wheeler, but I'm probably 50 50 at which dam I fish based on what's what the flow is. But to answer your question, I'll start in March with the white bass. Once the smallmouth are on the bed, I'll, I'll leave them alone uh, and go to the tail race and look for big stripers. They're usually off their spawn by then. Uh, but we do, the good thing is we do have options. I've seen fish spawning in my backyard in as early as, or late as early May, you know, some years. So, but June's the best time just from the having the, Still have some stripers yeah. below the dam, and you got the opportunity for make lies. In the fall of the year, we start chasing the bait. The fall of the year, if I was saying this to somebody earlier, if you read the publications like Bassmaster Magazine or all the, the tourism books, the, the time to go to the shoals and catch a world record smallmouth is in the fall, October, early November. That's that six weeks period. But that's also dealing with 100,000 CFS almost continually. And those guys who are catching the big smallmouth then are doing it with six pound test, free lining, live shad. It's tough to mimic that with a fly, right? I've tried it every way in the world. I've tried every clouser I can think of. And it's even if you can get a fly down to that depth, it's it's a lot more work than most people are willing to do. When you know you've got to have a full sink line, or even up, I've used a head, just a 30 foot head, and cast backing before just to try and get down and have some feel. A floating line, you know, in that much current, you, you can't, if you set the hook, it's because the fish was 100 yards away after he ate the hook. It's just tough to feel something in that much current. So I pick and choose. And when the current is hot, when the current's really rolling hot, the, the answer is to just get further downstream. It's easier to do that on Pickwick than it is on Wilson because you run out of lake on Wilson. It's only 15 miles long. But you can... When the current's really rolling in the fall, I'll typically fish downstream on Pickwick more or downstream on Wheeler. You know, Wheeler, the, the butt end of Wheeler is on the other side of Wheeler Dam. Uh, it's not a bad boat ride to the Decatur Flats, that grassy millpool area that catches a lot of big largemouth tournament action. At the end of the day, I guess what I would say is if you're coming to the shoals, don't panic if the one thing you wanted to do didn't work out because you've got a multitude of creeks. The lake action could be three different scenarios with water levels and flow and the tail races. So, is there any time of the year when the fishing is good on the south side on the rock walls? On the south side on the rock walls on Wilson? Oh, in the summer. In the summer. That's uh, again, June and July. There's a lot of night fishing that happens there. I don't do much of that, but those, those smallmouth prowl the bluffs. Uh, I'm sure y'all are aware, I'm not going to tell you how to fish, but, you know, most guys that I take who are learning will, will, will work that shoreline of 30 foot depth of water and just cast popping bugs into it instead of putting the bow of the boat on the rocks, you know, and casting alongside the bluffs. You know, that gives you a you know, work a clouser along the bluff instead of casting into it and retrieving back into, a, you know, an ocean. You know, changes the change, strike point. Changes, yeah. Well, from a, you know, I'm an old baseball coach. It's, it's all about staying in the strike zone. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're casting into that bluff, you've only got one strip, maybe two strips worth of strike zone. Yeah. But if you get alongside it and cast it, you're in the strike zone for the whole freaking shot. So there are ways to do it. And with Wilson Lake, also, there's so many coves. And, and on Pickwick, those coves get really shallow and flat in their, their carp areas. But on Wilson, they're deep all the way back in. You can stay on the points on the point of one cove and fish along one wall and just turn and fish along the other wall and get a lot of a lot of water to be had there. So so Wilson's probably the most safest area. 
if you're coming up to do it by if you're seriously if you're coming up to do it by yourself, Wilson can be done pretty safely. There's still you know the the recognizing the current. There's a couple other things I want to tell you about too. The way the lake is situated, facing due west, Wilson Lake, the Wheeler Dam Tail Race. Where am I here? Oh gosh, the Wheeler Dam Tail Race faces due west, and there's a notorious standing wave of water that happens there. When a west wind is blowing, which is most of the time there, if the, if the west wind has been blowing up 15 miles of lake and hits 100,000 CFS of water, it makes, it's not like going out of the Destin Harbor at low tide or anything, but for most locals in a small John boat, it's still a six foot wave is a pretty damn big wave. If you're, not, if you're just tootling along, not expecting a six foot wave, uh, you know, the six feet, yeah, here's where it happens, thank you. It's below in the tail race where that snot hits. And it can be substantial. You know, a six foot wave also goes down six feet. So you'll see boats disappear when they hit that thing. Somebody eats it every year, you know, sticks the bow under so far it can't go back up. That's, it, where the boat launch is. that's right where the boat launch is, is, is where there's all kinds of drama. That's why I also like to launch from my house. If I ever end up on the front page or on the news for murdering somebody, it'll be from an incident at a boat ramp. <laughs> Some hillbilly that's decided to get his stuff ready right at the ramp. But anyway, this pretty cool area. Uh, again, the horseshoe is famous. It can be done if you tiptoe. I don't take my fiberglass flats, folks, to this area at all. <coughs> I, I, I literally was born at the hospital overlooking this. My whole life. Uh, my dad was a taxidermist. I've seen a lot of fish that would have been world records mounted come out of this hole. But it's it can be done if you're if you're careful or if you're in your brother-in-law's boat and don't give her ass ass. Uh, but you can also the boat ramps here are close enough. That's one thing man we're blessed with here. You know, if you fish somewhere else and know that you have some days you have to crank up and run 20 miles to get to an area where you can fish. At the rock pile in particular, you can crank up and be running your trolling motor and be in, in the zone <coughs> in 20 minutes to get in the horseshoe here. So, well, where's the crappie over there? The crappie hole? Yeah. Pickwick's famous for the crappie. Pickwick, yeah, downstream, that's, uh, as you go into the, the Mississippi, Tennessee, Alabama junction, uh, the body of water that comes in from the southwest is Bear Creek. That's, that's the crappie action. It's been pretty good for years. We got some buddies that got just for that. They're trying to get me to catch them on the fly, but I, I can't ever get away from the smallmouth. Well, you've been scared me. You've almost hit that I know. I keep, thinking, yeah. you're a couple I keep thinking we'll get it. But anyway, I appreciate y'all having me up. I've got some cards. Woo! Yeah. And, uh, sir, it was an entertaining program. Yes, yeah, answer the question. Yeah, yeah, I, I can, I'll be glad to help out whatever group you've got. Again, I like to take a single on a trip if you're actually coming for a fishing trip or if you want to just an excursion. I've got a couple of regular customers from Tuscaloosa that come up and, and bring family and extended family for a week and just kind of book me for as they can. And I'll, I'll leave them kayaks and canoes. So I'll, again, I probably will be gone the month of July again this year. That worked out pretty well, except for the red tide. But I'm available to fish anytime. I am still a school teacher, but I'm the oldest school teacher there. And I, all the other teachers and principals are former students, so I can take off whenever the hell I want to. So I ain't afraid. Well, I ain't afraid to call, call in sick. Yeah, we anticipate uh, getting a couple of guide trips from you. We'll, yeah. we'll, re, we'll reevaluate that since we, we found out about you, how you should, how you want to fish and stuff. Right. And, well, again, uh, I can do whatever. My best trips, I think, are the, the combo trips to do a couple of hours on the yeah. tail race, unless something's happening on the way. Yeah. You know, that'd be left up to you. But the way we'll work it, we'll, uh, we'll decide how many trips we want to give away. We'll put them in the hopper, draw them out. And then they negotiate with you. Yes, sir. I'll be glad to help you. There's plenty of lodging there too. It's college town, University of North Alabama. Yeah. Uh, lots of, of course, the Airbnb business is booming. There are several houses on the lake that have access and, and boats. You don't want to haul a boat, but it's just two hours. Easy get. If you don't mind Highway 278. Yeah. <laughs> I've traveled it a few times. Uh, 
Yeah, well, let's give him a hey, hand. Hey, thanks for saying hi. We're going to we're going to continue on with our, our meeting. Right now, we're going to take about a, about a thirty minute uh, social hour, y'all. If, if he wants to hang around, I'm like, we got plenty of co coffee and, uh, and pie and cookies, and we'll we'll get back together here in about about 25 to 30 minutes, and uh, we'll do the major business of the program. <laughs> Two nominations 
for directors at large. They will serve on the board of directors with the with the other officers and those two. Do I hear any nominations? I have a nomination. I nominate our honorable president president to be one of our directors at large. And I second that motion. I'll second that. Are there any others? For the second one, I nominate Dale. Right here. Oh, yeah. I nominate Dale. I'll second that. Yeah, I'll second that. So we have two nominations for directors. Are there any more? Well, those nominations have been accepted and they've been recorded, and we will take a vote on those at our June or January the 6th meeting. Am I allowed to make a second nomination? Sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. sure. Well, we've got more than one person running for it. Yes. Yeah. Carrie Lester. What? What office? <laughs> well, 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 I'll. Terry Lester has been nominated for president, correct? No, no, no. Director at large. Oh, director at large. Okay. Second. I throw all my support behind Terry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, like I said, we've got these nominations. They've been recorded and on our meeting in June, January. What have I got June on my mind? About Mr. President, I have a further nomination for director since there's two of them. Okay. I nominate the Honorable Frank Chambers, who's currently on the board as a member. And I renominate next week. Okay, there's a fourth nomination for director at large. Are there any more? Okay. Nominations will close. We will vote on these candidates uh, January the 6th, right, January 6th meeting. And uh, all I say about that, I guess. All right, let's see where the rest we are. Okay, I was going yes. over our calendar. We got, we got some big events coming up. We got Senator Jones coming on the 6th with our elections on uh on February the 3rd, we got East Alabama Fly Fishing Club coming, and we have agreed to purchase uh, a fly trip with them for two people, and it will be it will be a part of our drawing on at the March meeting, at the March meeting, uh, and also at the March meeting, uh, Terry Lester has been trying to teach us all how to tie feral leaders, so we're going to ask him to. Uh, to show us how to do that, give us some demonstrations on tying those feral leaders. He's, I think he said he had about two miles of number two test line, so he got plenty of it for all of us to work with. Uh, and just today, I talked with Gary Warren, not Gary Warren, but Mike Warren at uh, Terrible Creek Outfitters and our March meeting it's March, actually be March the 6th. He's going to come and talk to us hey, about cool. kayaks, how to rig them out, how to, uh, to fly fish, uh, nice. so forth, so on, and uh, show us all that he it. can do for us and uh, stuff you can do yourself, really. So that will be our, our April 6th meeting. <laughs> yes? No, if any club that. member is seriously interested in purchasing a fishing kayak, I was recently at Bass Pro in Birmingham, and they have, if I were rebuying my kayaks today, that'd be the one I'd buy. So if anybody's interested, come see me, I'll give you some details. Okay. Uh, let me see what else do I have down here to talk to you guys about. Got the elections covered. Okay, I, I did I did tell everybody that uh, this will be the last meeting we have here, and it's for financial reasons only that uh, that we're having to leave here. Uh, and we're uh, we'll be at at my church, Trinity Lutheran Church, up on Rainbow Drive, and we'll 
We've got the whole fellowship hall. It's 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 as big as this room. And there's a kitchen across the hall. We're welcome to use all that. And we got flush facilities, so you don't you don't have to worry about that. Um, indoors. Indoors. Yeah. And like I said, in March we're gonna have a drawing for these these fly trips. Plus, I've got some items coming that we'll include in the drawing. We're, we're a long way off. We can get a bunch of other stuff. And we're going to make that pretty much the meeting that the, the meeting for that day, except for Terry and his uh and his tying of leaders. Uh, I talked to George Fant tonight about getting uh Jim Johnson to uh come talk to us again. He's he's the guy that owns the the guide service in Alaska we use. He owned the one in Michigan that we used up there because he sold it. Uh, I think he's got one down in uh, South Florida, Key West. Does he have Key West anymore? He had one in Belize, but I think he sold that. Yeah, he sold Belize, but I thought he had one in, in Key West or somewhere down there. He may not. I know he got he got tired of working all the time and he didn't have time to fish. So uh, he sold a bunch of them. Uh, well, we're trying to work up a trip, uh, you know, a visit for him and you. George says it looks like it will probably be uh, maybe in January next year. That's kind of his off season. So, anybody else got any uh, got any business they want to talk about? Yeah, yeah Mary. Can I just remind everybody if, if you didn't look at this when it was passed around, um, check it before you leave and. Seriously, if you don't see your name on this list and you thought you paid, come talk to me because that's what we're trying to do is make sure everything's out there. Don't be shy about it. We'll, we'll figure it out. But uh, the board of directors are working on two or three big items now that we should have, I hope to have answers for uh, at our January meeting. Oh, I can say about that at this point. So. About the five times, did anything come up on that? Oh yeah, yeah. There was uh, they have, they're interested. Anybody interested in starting back the uh, the fly time when we get to the church? Uh, it can be worked out, uh, and we got plenty of room, so we can we can we can a lot we can do that. So we'd be fly starting fly time. What time? At five thirty. From 5 30 to 6 30 or 5 to 6 30 or something like that. Somewhere in there, huh? Well, you said you had to iron out the slides on here? No, we don't have to iron out. Oh, I thought you said you had some other No, we have someone well, for the we have someone for the January meeting. Five to six thirty. Then I that I'm you know I'm I I'll just have to get you into church. I don't care what time to start. You just need to know. Huh? You just need to know. Yeah. Yeah. If y'all want to start at uh, <laughs> at five o'clock, then I can come by there on my way to dinner and stuff, let you in and whatever. But the church was real gracious. They're eager for us to be there. They like they like bringing in outside organizations. It just shows that their dedication to to the community around us. So uh, we want to take don't want to take advantage of that, but we've got it for as long as we need it. We just gotta, you know, just keep it clean. Don't, don't make a mess, straighten up every time we leave and so forth. But we won't have any problems. Yeah, we don't make much of a mess. Nah. Just can you one spilled that coffee all over the floor. No, that wasn't me. Oh I cannot tell a lie. It must have been carried. <laughs> Well, I'm scraping the bottom of the barrel. I can't come up with anything else right this minute, uh, except for we need to clean this place up. Uh, it looks like there's plenty of pies and cookies and cakes, and I don't know what they're planning on doing with them. But... Not as many as there used to be. <laughs> there used to be. 
Uh, our friend Tony. Feel free to take some time with Please. All right. Well, I'll uh, I'll let the meeting adjourn if you want to do that. And y'all hang around, help us clear this trash out, and clean the floors. And oh, we got a fly tie. Tries all to do. All right, we're going to take a few minutes to do this fly draw. Looks like it's about the three people signed up. Are there any other, anybody else want to get involved with the fly draw? I brought a fly, but I didn't see where, where we're going to do that. Yeah, we're going, to, we're going to do it. We just had to postpone it a little while. Nobody told me. Yeah, we're going to do it.